into the thing, it's actually in your Xbox, right? So the possibilities are just going to open up, and we are not there yet. It's um, like the joke used to be like we were shooting for right ones and run everywhere. We ended up with right ones and suck everywhere. Right? <laughs> it's, it's not easy. And they're, they're still not there yet, even on their own platform, but they're trying. They're taking the right steps in, in, in that direction. So this is for the hardcore folks, the Angry Bird folks, who really want that every pixel be custom painted and have down to the metal performance. So you can do C and C++ and DirectX for gaming on Windows 8. You can use it for other things. It'll be really hard to write business applications in DirectX. It's just too much effort. This is the new work, right? <clears throat> so if you are a web developer with HTML5 or CSS or JavaScript background, you are now partially a Windows 8 developer. And that's kind of the audience they wanted to reach out to and say, hey, you can do HTML5 and CSS and build native Windows applications, right? And this is where it took them a lot of effort here because the kind of APIs that you're going to have access to if you wanted to go ahead and reach the camera from JavaScript versus reaching the camera from C Sharp, it's exactly the same. They have language projections in Winarchy, which means that the same APIs are simply projected and they do some object mapping behind the scenes. So uh, what we call an int in .NET may not be the same, I mean int may be the same, but something else may not be the same in JavaScript, right, or Java. So they want to have that mapping there so that what you consume from the Winarchy APIs looks exactly the same no matter what be your UI language of choice. That makes sense? So what we are dealing with is this comfort zone of C Sharp VB or XAML. How many of you guys are VB guys? Yay! You guys are getting rarer nowadays, but it's still good to see like I, I don't use it. Now. VB games. It's not really. I mean, it, it's come a long way, and I mean, it's not really that different from C Sharp anymore. Okay, so we digressed a whole lot, but here's your Windows 8 application, right? So what you're seeing here is a vanilla Windows 8 application, and if I can control my mouse, what you see here is a very similar looking .NET application, right? Your properties, your references, your assets, apps of XAML, and then these are your XAML pages, right? So these are the pages that you'll actually see in your application, right? These are the pages that you navigate back and forth. If this was using HTML5, these things will just be HTML instead of XAML, right? And instead of having a .cs file here, you just have a JavaScript file, right? Okay, so let's get back to our, um, our chat application, which we started on this web server, but we never finished on the client. Let's run this thing. Where's my mouse gone? Here. And let's see if our server is still up. It's kind of waiting. All right. So. Uh, if you guys have not done Windows 8 development, it's very easy, it's out of the box, all of the tools are free, it works perfectly fine with Visual Studio Express. This, I just have the ultimate version, but it works fine with Express. And you can deploy your applications either natively on localhost, which I'll show you right here. See this guy? This local machine means if you're running Windows 8, you cannot develop for Windows 8 unless you're running Windows 8. So you can deploy your app on your machine. Or you can actually deploy a remote machine, which is beautiful. Because what they have managed to do is, I have my dev machine here, my surface is sitting on the other side of my table, and it's completely not connected to this. Over Wi-Fi, I can deploy to my surface, and also debug through it as my app is running, which is really cool, right? Or you can use something like a simulator if you do not have an RT device or a tablet. Because a lot of times, I mean, your simulator is going to be your savior, because if you do not have a tablet, you do not quite to get to try out your touch events or your orientation. Um, actually, someone was, is really funny. Someone was uh, saying the MacBook Airs have accelerometers built in. So someone actually wrote a racing game where you can turn your MacBook Air around, which is really fun. But the point is, you're, you're not going to have everything on your desktop or your laptop, right? So that's where the simulator comes in and it gives you touch events. It gives you uh, orientation and rotational events, right? So we're going to deploy to the simulator here. Right. Okay. So this is a simulator, right? And it's um, not really an emulator, which means it's not running on its own VM, 
the Windows Phone thing is actually an emulator within Windows 8, but this thing is similar, to, which means it just mimics everything that your desktop applications. This is my desktop on my machine. It's just mimicking the desktop. And this is where you have your touch events, right? So basic touch events, your rotational touch, and then you can flip the screen around clockwise and clockwise. This is the best part. How many of you are Mac users? Okay, so a couple of polyglots maybe. <laughs> See this guy? This is MacBook Retina. Windows 8 looks beautifully crisp on super high resolution screens. They had a demo in um, I think TechEd or WPC where they had a guy running Windows 8 natively on an 80 inch uh, multi-touch TV and it was beautiful because all of the graphics are scaled up proportionally they need a little help from you as developers. I mean, some graphics, if you just stretch it, it's just going to look awkward. But they give you choices of three, three different resolutions and scaling factors. And this thing scales up to wicked sizes. It is really uh, comfortable. And it comes down to like 1024 by 768 if, if you're working on a bad um, laptop or tablet. So let's get back to our app. Maybe? I'll launch it again. So, since I got to know about the fact that I'm speaking at 3 o'clock and this not being my dev machine, I didn't have any of this code here. So I took an hour and just got from whatever pieces I could do. It's looking really bad because that's my demo because I did not have time to make a flashy demo, but hopefully you get, get the point here. So this is just my first screen says you need to go and head to the chat room. Let's do that. So this is my signal R power chat room, right? And I'll show you what it's doing behind the scenes. But right out of the gate, it says, hey, somebody joined. Who is this guy? Go back to our, wait, where's my alt tab? Here. See this guy? See, if the resolution is good enough, we could have docked these two things side by side, but we cannot quite. Yeah, you get close, right? So this is my tablet. I'm walking around on the, on the street with this. You're back home on the browser, right? <coughs> right away, I know that you joined my chat room. So from the web, I can say stuff like this. And I can hit the broadcast. See, the web obviously knows that I can just replicate that. Let's see this guy here. I mean, it's nice to see this side by side. You can see it almost real time, but it's, I mean, it's hard to get two screens side by side here. But you see this and how real time this is, right? So maybe this would be a better example because you can see it, see the um, web thing in the background. See, it, it's almost like instant, right? And there's no, nothing talking between the phone <coughs> or the Windows 8 emulator and the web. It's literally HTTP traffic that's happening. And then when I go back, back to my screen, this guy knows that I left the chat room, right? So just a very crude demo, but Think about this. You have one single backend, right? And that single backend can serve real time communication to any type of client, which is really very powerful, right? If you were writing an ESPN app and this was your one backend, you can do real time applications to all mobile devices and tablets, right? Who I mean, would want that? So, how did we do this? Let's unpack that a little bit. Where's my all tab? On my computer is acting up, I'm sorry. Alt F4? <laughs> Alt F4. So let's look at the Windows 8 stuff. Here's what we did. We went into our solution and we said, I need a NuGet package. And this I don't want because this is for the server. This is the entire thing. I don't need the entire thing. I don't need JavaScript in my XAML or .NET application. What I'm going to grab is this guy. See, it's a similar client for .NET applications. Now, this doesn't have a whole lot of backward support yet, but it's getting there. I mean, this needs like .NET 4.0 for now, right? But that's all I need. Once I have this, guess what this is going to do? This is going to replace the JavaScript that they had for web applications. The JavaScript that was doing the heavy lifting and the magic behind the scenes to take the best transport and then keep that transport alive, keep that constant persistent connection alive. This is going to do the same thing, but from a document client, right? So with that in place, I simply have a reference here. Um, see this guy? 
And does this look familiar? It's JSON, right? So all of this communication between the client and the server is actually happening over JSON, right? And that's the guy. Um, and I wish I could show you a better example. It's on my dev machine. It's not here. But I had a Windows Phone uh, demo where I was actually sending a complex enterprise object over the wire through Signal R. And the reason we can pull it off is because of that Newton.json. Literally, uh, your serialization and deserialization comes free if it's a JavaScript based file. Yes? Is it tightly bound to that specific, you know, is it coupled with, with the Newton soft JSON implementation or could you use like the fast for, lit JSON, fast for, JSON? For now it is. Now, you're not uh, restricted to it, but you're going to have to go inside their code to do the serialization and deserialization yeah. with your own means. But out of the box, it gives you Newton soft. Out of curiosity, can you use the signalr.net client in portable class libraries? We'll try. We'll try that. Uh, uh, why uh, not? More additional question. Can you use it inside from that and can you use it inside of a, uh, like a web worker? So if you have the web worker, you know, post the, uh, the script that's actually the call into the, to the website. And, if that is Wait, the you're talking thing. back end side or client side? No, on the client side. So like a, you know, uh, what what is your client application in that case? It's it's a web application. Yeah, but I'm just saying like a, you know an HTML5 worker, you know, so it's it's a like an extra thread on the, you know that I don't know if it's an official part of the HTML5 spec now or not. I believe it is, but you spin up a. You know, work on the client. So you're not talking like so an Azure or worker process. You're just talking about an HTML5 thing, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a separate browser thread to okay. run. You know, HTML5 what what would be your application type? So you have a few choices, right? You can either get the JavaScript version of the similar client side DLLs, or you can get the .NET thing. Uh -huh. So it's one of these two for now, <clears throat> until they build more things. Um, let's get back to your thing in just a second. Let me show you some code. We'll actually try it. I, I'm, I'm curious because that would be interesting if you can put it in a PCL. Okay, so here's what we're doing on the um, document side of things. So we have those two in place. When I go to, well, see this main page? This is where it starts up, right? So if I go to my app sample, this is where your processing begins. This is your on launch event, which means that I tapped on a tile and the app is starting to run. And I'm saying, hey, you need to go to this um, main page, right? That's my starting page. This is this guy. This is main page, right? And then when you hit that button, I take you to a different page. And that's my signal R page, which is here. So here's what's happening on the signal R page. The XAML part of it, um, for those of you who do not do XAML, this is the UI side of it. This is the UI stack. And this is, it looks very, it looks like a lot, but it's very simple, actually. It's just XML. So you have some header information here, and then you have some layout information. A grid is what we commonly use to lay stuff on screen. So if I go back to my app here, and if I go this, see, I literally broke up the screen into um, two rows, the top row being the header, and the rest being um, the text box here, and then the chat box here. So this is that grid, that top grid, and then this is the page title and then this is the page content. And you'll notice that I have a simple text box for the chat message and then a button and then this is the text block which shows you the dialogue. Just very simple XML stuff. And then I have event handlers um, responding to it when you post a message. But what's happening here is more interesting. Okay. <coughs> so the best part is this is a ThinkPad. This is a Lenovo ThinkPad. It's a beautiful machine. What you're going to freak out with is they flip the control and the function keys and we are like hardwired, like our muscle memory is so used to the control key being the leftmost thing. It just really freaks me out. Uh, there's a BIOS setting where you can change it back in, but I haven't done that yet. So here's my uh, XAML backend code, right? This is using that DLL. So give me reference to those things that I can use. Here's what we're doing. Here's my signal chat, which is my UI layer. I simply create something called a hub proxy. Again, this is a class that you, that's coming from the DLL, right? It's, it's from the Microsoft CMR.DLL. What I'm trying to do here is I'm not going to make, so you need to understand that this application as it's running 
it does not have a direct reference back to the server. I'm not doing an add service reference and giving it the URL and so on. So it has to figure out what it is that it's working with. It needs a proxy. That's what the proxy thing is. This guy is literally going to take a look at the endpoint of the URL and try to figure out what is it that the server can support. That, that's what this proxy is for. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about this delegate and event in just a second. Um, but take a look at what we're doing here. This hub connection is no different from that hub connection we're using on a JavaScript client, right? So we want to create a connection back to a chat hub, which is, uh, are we running late? You got time. Got time. How about 10 more minutes? Sure, we'll no problem. Problem. Okay, so we're trying to create a chat connection to this local host 1141. If you remember, this guy is running on 1141, right? So it doesn't need to be local the moment you push it up to an actual server, you gotta give it the actual server URL. So I'm trying to create a reference to that hub, and this is what gets me that creation of the proxy. I'm just saying, go reach out to that URL and see what you find for that chat hub, right? Now, I can do things like this. Very similar to what we did in JavaScript, we're just gonna say connection.start. This fires off that handshake, the negotiation, to figure out what type of client are you, what type of web server am I, can we talk using this or this or this. Right? So that negotiation thing. Now it gets a little nicer in .NET 4.5 because you get to use the async await keywords which gives you a little bit of magic and not verbose text. So this guy could take 5 seconds, could take 10 seconds, I don't know. And I cannot hose up my UI, my UI thread, right? So this is where this guy comes into play. And if you notice my uh, my method here is decorated with an async. You guys know about async and await? All of you? Okay, that's good. <clears throat> it's, re it's really beautiful what they're doing under the covers. This is not saying that the method overall is doing something asynchronous, it's just a decorator to the compiler to say, hey, by the way, you might have a busy operation here. Look out for the first await. And it gets the first await right here. And it's, it's funny how you, what it does behind the scenes. When you run it, it literally splits up the method into two programs, or I mean two sections, I guess, right? So everything that's beyond the, that, that's before the first await gets executed, it sees the first await and says, oh, this is a long thing. I'm not gonna hold up my UI, I'm gonna move on. And I'm not gonna run any of the stuff that comes after the await until I get that thing handled, whatever it is that you're trying to do, until I get that back. So your program execution actually goes back to the previous method which called this method, right? So um, this is really nice, but it can also get you into a little trouble if you don't know what you're doing, you might end up with a race condition, right? So if you're, if while we, when we enter this method, if we had stuff after this method which dependent on, which were dependent on things inside this method, you're gonna have a race condition because it's gonna literally stop here and not do the rest until it figures out this part because then the rest of the objects get hydrated after this. So let's say we did that asynchronously. Once my chat state says, yep, I'm connected, I'm good to go, here's what we're doing. On the similar chat hub, we are invoking this method called join chat, and we are sending over, whatever, this is just demo stuff, right? I'm giving the user a name, and I'm sending over a device ID. This join chat, does that look familiar? This is, can I close it? No. That's this guy, right? So from my .NET client, I'm simply calling a method on the server to say, hey, I'm just trying to join you. Can you take me in? Right? That's what we do from the client side. What we do next is a little, I would say, a little uncomfortable for now, but I see why they're doing this. So on, if you were a web-based client, the server could simply reach out into your JavaScript on the client side and invoke a method on you. Right? You do not want that on a .NET client, and for security reasons, you do not want somebody reaching inside your DLL and invoking a method out of the blue, right? even if you have a constant connection. So it's, it, the syntax doesn't look very sugary, but essentially here's what we're doing. We are subscribing on the hub. We do have a connection to the server, obviously. On the hub, there is a proxy or a sort of a method that says on, and this is your hook to say, I want to listen to stuff that happens in the server. I don't want you to just call me randomly. If something happens on the server, hey, I have an event handler for you right here. So if the 
server invokes something like add chat message, which, let's go back to the server here. See this? The moment somebody joins the chat, or the moment we do a push, when somebody is already in the chat, we are doing this over and over again, right? If this thing happens on the server, here's my event delegate. This is what you do. You raise an event here. Uh, this can be whatever you want. Um, but essentially, I'm raising an event here, and there's an event handler sitting right here. That's right here. When the signal says, yep, I have a new not notification for you, uh, I'm going to increment my chat dialog with what's new, and what's coming down from the server. Right? See, it's coming down. This E contains the chat message. Now, guess what this is? Why am I having to do this? Because UI through it. Exactly. Because this is like Silverlight and Windows Phone, Windows 8 type, they all have the same things. The UI thread is the least um, bothered, and if stuff is happening where you do not know when events might trigger, that's not on the UI thread. So you need a marshalling back so that the UI thread, you can update stuff on the UI thread, because otherwise you're going to get like thread exceptions across. Right. So when you do um, a post message, which is when I hit this button, that's a post message, right? This is what we're doing. We're simply saying, hey, make sure you have, you have typed something. And then I'm going to go back into the hub and say, go push message to clients. And I'm going to send you whatever you typed in. That's how the web gets it. And that's how any other client who's connected to that web hub could get it as well, right? So the magic is I could be on a Windows 8. You could be on a Windows phone. He could be on an uh, iOS device, and somebody else could be on the web, and they can all see the same messages because it's all being controlled by the same hub, right? Um, so that's that. Let's see what else. Um, and when you leave, leave the page. This is the on navigated from that fires when I when I hit this button here. When I hit that, it's just gone. When that fires, I want to go back into the hub and say I want to invoke this method and say that I'm leaving the chat room, right? So none of this stuff is interesting. Any, I mean, the most interesting thing is this, and um, this here, and this here. The rest is whatever your application needs, right? So just similar to what we did from the web, we have a way to create a connection to a hub on the server, and then invoke methods on the server. If something happens on the server, we have listeners on the client side, which can take action based on whatever the server is telling us. It makes sense so far on a Windows 8 .NET client. Now this is going to work exactly the same way if you had um, a .NET console application or if you had a Windows Phone application. It's exactly the same code that's going to work in both ways, right? You just connect to a server, create a proxy, and then uh, start the connection. So let's let's do. Uh, is there any way to create a proxy specifically for that communication, kind of like you did in the JavaScript? So you can actually call a, a method with that name as opposed to the invoke with the string? No, not yet. Not on the document side yet. Um, they have talked about this, um, but it just literally means that the proxy is going to have